Where'd you get these two guys from? Hello, welcome to episode two of the Talking Sport Podcast. It's Daniel Hussey here again, alongside my brother Sean. How's it going? And firstly, we want to give a thanks for all the feedback on episode one. That's life as a football agent that should be in all your podcast feeds now. How was your week, Sean? Good. Uh, played a bit of golf, played a bit of good golf. Uh, got back training uh, with the Jers, our football team, our Gaelic football team. So the legs were a bit sore after that, I'm not going to lie, but good to get a bit of running back in the legs. Yeah, the Jers sent a bit of a search party out for you halfway through lockdown, but we managed to get you back eventually. Well, I, I enjoyed my lockdown, I'll put it that way. But as soon as I got back to training, I gave one kick pass at the start. And James Moffat turned around and said, go back to talking nonsense on the podcast. So I'm not looking forward to that over the next co- next couple of weeks. Yeah, that, this is probably where you belong, to be fair. But um, yeah, we, we have a couple of exciting announcements coming over the next few weeks in terms of different podcasts. Um, but look, we're going to turn our attention to rugby this weekend for episode two. Sean, what we got in store? We speak to our next door neighbour, Charlie Rock, of 15 years. Uh, former SCT winning captain with Black Rock in 2013, had a pro contract with Leinster. He'll talk to us about the highs and lows of his Leinster career, to su- his success with Black Rock and the culture uh, around Leinster at that time. And It's a really, really interesting chat. A lot of stuff that we learnt just there about him. Uh, so it's a really, really good chat and, and stay tuned. Exactly, and yeah. new music from D. Cullen to come later in the show, but we've a lot to get through with Charity and we'll have a good chat afterwards as well. So let's get to the interview. <laughs> Delighted to say to welcome to the podcast, winning senior cup captain with BlackRock 2013, former Belvedere, Leinster and Lansdowne player, as well as an Ireland under-20 international, but most importantly, our next door neighbour for the best part in 15 years. Charlie Rock, welcome to the podcast. How are we? Very good. Thanks, lads. Thanks thanks for having me on. It's, yeah. a, it's a pleasure. You're more than welcome, Charlie. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, we wanted to start, I suppose. We, 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 we lived next door for the best part of 15 years. We had we'd some good times now to do with sport anyway. Yeah, geez. I mean, I was only thinking about that before jumping on the pod. I think thinking about how many endless nights we had just on the road playing God knows how many sports. Like, I remember at one stage, myself, Daniel, and Sean probably as well, you're set, all of us are playing tennis randomly set up a net in the cul-de-sac. <laughs> So, I mean, I think our whole childhoods have been kind of shaped through different sports that we all love. I remember you, Charlie, down near uh, anyone who knows us, we have a green outside our house, and you would find any angle to try and kick over the, the lamppost. I remember you, you compared yourself to Morgan Power at one stage. <laughs> yeah, I wish I, I wish I was able to live up to that. Unfortunately, it didn't quite go to plan. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, I think it was funny. I think I remember, you know, we all collectively used to kind of, you know, develop our skills in different ways. If it was, you know, I remember you lads with the hurls at one stage trying to trying to nail the the lamppost with um, the Schlitter, and for me, it was trying to kick rugby kick a rugby ball straight over it, and then obviously the infamous kind of. Uh, three and in games that you play against uh, your pillars. So I can, I'd say now is probably all of our, a good time for all of us to apologise to any neighbours lights we kicked off <laughs> over the last 15 years. <laughs> and some of them listen to the podcast as well. So yeah. that's pretty much it. Yeah. yeah, so there's a nod, there's a nod to, the, to, the, to the gang. <laughs> and then with Will and Jamie as well, the one-on-one battles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it was pretty relentless how we did it. I mean, it was always... I think the, the cool thing about it, I think for all of us playing sport growing up, is it was always really competitive, no matter what. Like even if it was just yeah. three of us out in the road, like everyone was competitive. And I think from my early time playing, I think that was ultimately I actually landed on that a little bit because you know you have to be clutch at times. It was a ruthless business when we were kids, and um, but I think you know I'm sure you lads would probably agree that it definitely helped with your your skills in all different sports. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I think Sean being a few years younger, we had to kind of deal with his tantrums because for the, the cricketers that are listening, the big reason Sean's a massive cricket uh, fan is mainly because of charity here for buying that bloody cricket set a few years back. <laughs> I don't know if I've you to thank or or not, Charlie. All the credit. As I said, we played. I don't know how many. I reckon there wasn't any sport that we missed at one stage trying to play. And I think cricket was obviously, that came a little bit later when I kind of went into Black Rock when I was kind of 13, 14. I think, Sean, you just fell in love with it like straight away. I think it was the only, one of the only sports that you just relentlessly wanted to play. So it was obviously yeah. cool to see you kind of kick that on. Well, uh, yeah, because we are lucky with the, the driveway we had, it actually lends itself to cricket quite well. Um, yeah, I think for all of us, I think we probably had plenty of good memories to reflect on in the sporting world. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Some good memories there. Um, I want you to give a little bit of background to those that may not be fully aware of yourself, Charlie, and how you kind of got into the game of rugby. I know you started off with Belvedere, and your dad, your dad Philip, was the coach there, and obviously you got a, a cap for Leinster as well. Yeah, so, I mean, I, rugby has always been a massive part of my life. I think my dad played until he was, until I think his back gave out or whatever it might be. I think he would blame any injury. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, he, yeah, I think it was always a massive part of, you know, my life. I think he brought me down initially when I was four to kind of play under fives when with my brother Will, who's a year older, was playing as well. Um, and it was just always on. So all of my relatives were all massive rugby heads, all my, my uncles, aunts, even on my mum's side. My cousins all played rugby. So, yeah, it was just very much brought up, surrounded by rugby and all sports. Like, I'm obviously, as we've just talked about, you know, sports was, was always just something I loved. But rugby was just something that was always on and something I knew I was kind of better at maybe than other sports. And I think I think where it started for me was playing kind of mini rugby in in old Belvedere my dad was the coach so you know he could put up with the crime age five and you know all the way through he can teach you a bit of discipline um, and then yeah I think I, I knew that from a skill set from me being a young young lad I knew that I had the skills that were a little bit better maybe than, than other you know kids my age just from you know you know you go home at, you know mum will ask you know how did the the match go at age what eight and you'd be saying there I scored five tries and uh, you just kind of got the feeling that you know I was you know pretty good for like someone who was, who was quite young um, and then yeah I guess it just kind of you know developed you know through that and um, obviously after kind of mini rugby I went to Black Rock um, and kind of worked my way up interestingly enough actually in, in first year in Black Rock I uh, didn't play for the under 13s team I was actually so behind Gary Ringrose, who started a score and a half ahead of me at 13. Yeah, so Gary was always just incredible. Um, you know, some would say now we joke about it, I probably peaked a little bit too early <laughs> um, because after that kind of second year, third year, I kind of came into my own and third year I kind of started for score and a half with the JCT um, and then fourth year I ended up having a cracking season and ended up starting for the SCT when I was 16 or just turned 16. Um, and then fifth year then was a bit of a, a kind of a strange year where I didn't really get on with the coach um, who ended up being the coach that I won the senior cup with. So a bit of a roller coaster of kind of, uh, um, you know, management, if you like. Yeah, you know, I kind of had a tendency at times to, to kind of live in spite of people. I still do can throw the old toys out of the pram. Um, but, you know, eventually managed to recover that relationship with the coach and then go on to, to captain in rock then uh, to win the senior cup in 2013 so it kind of just kept getting better for me kind of as you know from kind of i guess 15 all the way through to kind of 19 20 and um, came out then of you know rock and there wasn't you know the academy doesn't really start after school much like you, you might think um with you know the the football in england as your uncle was talking about last week um it actually you know you have to do kind of a year of kind of they have to kind of weed you out and, um, you know, they get you into kind of a training routine in the sub-academy. Um, and so then I kind of captained the Leinster under-20s team um, and then eventually got into to the kind of academy. Um, and so kind of in, in line with that, in kind of, you know, graduating into the academy was the same year I played uh, Ireland under-20s. So, yeah, it's it had always been like a, you know, a gradual kind of upward rise um, for me. Obviously, it didn't come without its challenges, but I'm sure we'll probably get into that a little bit later on. Yeah, you you mentioned the. I actually wasn't aware that you, you had a bit of an issue with the coach in 2012, and then you ended up winning it as his captain in 2013. Tell us a little bit more about how how you guys resolved that, or. Yeah, so I mean, it was um, you know one of the, the yeah I think in in fourth year I was uh, so you're, 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 I literally have just turned 16, got an opportunity to start for the S that season. You know, I think that that particular team wasn't amazing given the standard of SET teams, but I was still obviously great to start. Um, and then the next, and you know what, I think because I was so young, I was actually exposed to it maybe a little bit too soon. I didn't really get to have that kind of fourth year that people get to have where they can kind of take the foot off the gas a little bit, uh, you know, after doing the junior cert, for example. So I was, you know, straight into it. 
Um, so that, that year kind of drained me because I had to take it a lot more seriously than other people in fourth year. Um, and then kind of when it came fifth year, I think there, just, there was a little bit of an attitude shift for me. I think I definitely thought that, you know, things should have just been given to me because I played the year before. Um, you know, I wasn't really putting the work in. You know, I, I always had the skill set. Um, but there was kind of a, a case where you know, I probably wasn't working as hard as I thought. Like, you know, things would get given to me. Um, and yeah, obviously there was a you know I'm gonna yeah you know, there's a guy in, in my position there who who could kick in the end and that's kind of what made the difference in terms of getting selected. So they didn't actually carry a scrum uh, a sub scrum half that year, and the, the second centre was like covering nine, so they didn't actually take a, a scrum half that year, um, and the the starting scrum half could kick the goals. So um, yeah, so so that was kind of funny. So that year I just yeah really didn't get on with the coach. Subsequently, then that year they they got knocked out of the first round. You know, it all kind of happened almost like a, a storybook. The the nine who started got injured in that first round game, so he couldn't kick. <laughs> um, and then the the kind of the second centre. Then I think he hadn't really played nine all year, so it just kind of broke down. And then classic me. Then I think two weeks later, I uh, was playing for Belvo at kind of under seventeens, and kind of as we touched on at the start of the pod, you know, was back to kicking goals. And I think I. I kicked like something like twelve points or something, um, and like booted one from like between the the halfway and the ten to like win this like under seventeens cup. And I remember the SET coach, the, the same guy, looking at me and kind of blankly asking me why I never said I could kick, <laughs> which was quite funny because that probably would have made the difference. But yeah, um, and then yeah, so kind of then come sixth year, then we kind of just sat down. It was very much a case of like, right, let's resolve this because there wasn't much depth at nine. Obviously, I knew kind of where I had to be. That fifth year that, that I played, I, I got dropped down to the fifth year team. And that was the where we kind of bonded with the fifth years and the fourth years. I had the likes of, you know, Jeremy Lockman, Nick Timoney, Gary Ringrose, um, all of these now pros who made up that fourth and fifth year team. So he knew there was something there, uh, but we just kind of had to resolve it. And, you know, eventually we did. Uh, so yeah, we had it all out, hashed it all out, got everything out that we needed to say, you know, put the differences aside, I guess, and for the benefit of the team, and the rest is history. And then Chad, you would have played in that team. Then obviously you were the, the scrum half, and then the starting ten was actually your cousin Peter Quirk. Yeah, yeah. So it was always a family affair, as I said from the start. And uh, you know, Peter is always, you know, uh, always is, still is a very talented rugby player. He starts for Black Rock College or FC. I think he's kind of keeping them in in the mix there with his kind of goal kicking, and um, so yeah, that was always a really cool thing to be able to share it with him, you know. And because we were always back and forth at each other's houses, we had this kind of like, you know, what we thought was a Stringer O'Gara connection, and um, kind of you know born from family blood. So yeah, that definitely lended itself to to the success of that team for sure. And then moving on from that, and we'll come back a little bit on in terms of the final on in Blackrock. But moving on to the Leinster Academy, you, you, that was the summer twenty fourteen. You got in there, yeah, summer twenty fourteen. And to, to be honest, it wasn't a gift. Um, you know, I think you know I had a year where I captained the, the Leinster under twenties, uh, or yeah, Leinster under twenties. So that would have been my first year, kind of out of school for my age bracket, um, and went really well in that interpros. I think I, you know, for for me, I would never really big my, my game up. I think I scored like six or seven tries. And to be fair, our, our team was class, uh, but I was really kind of cooking cooking some good uh, good game at the time. And I, did, I remember lads were after those that Interpro series were given their kind of contracts. They were called in and kind of explained that they were going to get a contract, um, and I didn't, um, and I kind of couldn't really understand why. And um, now, obviously, there was a scrum half in there who was the same age as me, Nick McCarthy, who's uh, super talented. He he's, he still plays for Munster. Um, but he he had already got a kind of a an early contract, an early academy contract. Um, so yeah, it was very much. I actually didn't get handed it straight away. I had to do like a summer trial with the senior team to to essentially prove myself. Um, and that kind of I guess in terms of my own career, that's probably where the self doubt started to creep in even before I got offered a, an academy contract. Um, just because I knew, even after a quality Interpro series, that you know you could be you know, captain of Leinster under-20s, you can score seven tries or whatever it is, but you know, you're not going to get 
you know, they still, you know, they really still trust me. Um, so yeah, that that was kind of the interesting one. But you know, like kind of everything, the you know, good sports stories, I managed to come through the end of that. Ended up really impressing in that summer. Um, and then after that, I think it was you know end of August they signed the dotted line. Then for three years, brilliant. And then off the back of that, you got the call up to the Ireland under twenties. And I'm kind of wondering just what you said there in terms of the self doubt. Uh, even getting the call up to that squad was did you still have that bit of self doubt in your ability? Yeah, because I mean, like you know, given everything, you know, I was never the you know I got I got called up to the Irish twenties in the last camp before the summer, so it was Easter. So bearing in mind that this team had gone through the Six Nations, you know, if that would have been in you know February, uh, I wasn't involved there. I never even received a phone call from from the Irish team. Uh, I know that the Nick Nick McCarthy, who was ahead of me, um, as I said, hugely talented guy. He was already in the academy from the year prior as a young guy, as the kind of rising star. So he was kind of the nine in there, and I think maybe politics wise, they were looking at other provinces to try and fill that you know nine spot. Um, but yeah, nothing again, you know, I kind of never received anything. I just kind of kept chipping away, kind of kept working hard. I was playing for Belvo at the time. Um, and again, you know, just having a really great season, you know, like scoring some really good drives. Like when I look back on it and saying like, it was really, you know, out there to prove a point. Um, and I think it was, you know, saying like, I'm going to be big in myself up here, but I remember I scored like a, a 50 meter break or something against Taron Muir and it ended up being on that show against the head. I don't know if you guys have ever yeah, watched I remember, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like I was, it was not too corker. Like I was delighted, but then the day after that, the coach for the twenties rang me then and said he obviously saw that and knew I was involved, and he wanted me to come into camp. Um, and then yeah, I just had to kind of get ahead of. So I was kind of fourth after that call, and then I had to kind of prove my worth through like an Easter camp, which I eventually did, and then I managed to get a seat on the under twenty plane. So it's never been a, it's never been a smooth ride. I definitely have never been a a coach's first choice off the bat. Yeah, and actually, funnily enough, you mentioned Nick McCarthy. It, he was his him getting injured that got you that start against Wales, where you ended up scoring a try in the World Cup. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, yeah, I guess as far as when you, you when you when you look at it like that, it, it is very much like rugby is always going to come down to kind of injuries. Um, he he got like you know you know God love him like he's you know he puts his body on the line all the time, and he does get like you know he would even say himself he can be quite injury prone. Um, you know, picks up um, you know, different kind of injuries as everyone does. Um, so I guess you know I was probably fortunate for my own game. I guess that you know the game prior against New Zealand, um, I think Nick had got injured after about ten minutes. So I managed to play like seventy minutes against the, you know, a full New Zealand outlet. Now to be fair, we did we did lose, but we didn't get spanked, and I think I was able to kind of prove that, you know, I could make, kind of make stuff happen. Uh, and then yeah, the game after that against Wales, and actually. We were down by a good bit, by like I think three tries or something, but I uh, was able to almost start a revival with a try, which was nice, definitely to prove the worth. Yeah, and it was a brilliant team, obviously playing with the likes of Joey Carby. Um, just moving on, uh, fast forward a little bit then to your Leinster debut. Um, you you play it was against the Dragons in December, uh, twenty sixteen. Could you talk us just about the lead up to the game and when did you know it was on the cards for that season? Yeah, so um, I think. The thing that people probably don't understand with the Leinster Academy, you know, since Lancaster came in, was that it went from academy never training with the senior players to the academy all of them training with the senior players. So you're always going to be in front of the coaches. Um, Which now is a good thing. the reality, yeah, it's a great thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a great thing. Um, and I think you know, you know, a lot of the time they will know who their team is, but you're going to get knocks along the way, and people might be away with Ireland. Um, where Ireland might might say, I think in the, in in that case, I think you know somebody got injured. I think Nick potentially, or he was with, I think was he away, or was there a camp on, or something like. I'm not, I can't even remember what kind of break I got. They're actually resting a guy, um, and it was very much like, yeah, you're you know you're going to be on the bench. I think Gibson Park actually might have been injured, um, and I think Nick was coming back from injury, um, so it, like it was kind of lucky that I got a little bit of a break. Um, and then, yeah, I think I was just really ready for it. I think that season I'd kind of like, you know, I'd been playing well. Um, I just kind of wanted to, you know, Lancer A had been going really well. So I kind of just wanted a, a crack to, got to to kind of get out there. So, yeah, I was, I was kind of ready, I think, when I, when I got the chance. Yeah, so how, how was the, the buzz of coming on for that game? Like it was, it was about 15, 10, 15 minutes ago, I'd, I'd say you were getting nervous. 
Yes, 18 minutes to be precise. I'm gonna remember that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I was nervous. I think the cool thing is about training under Lancaster. You know, I'd still kind of hands down say he's probably one of the best coaches I've ever played under. It was very much like that McGregor mentality where you're doing so many repetitions in training and you're training at such a high intensity that it always feels like a match. So, you know, the best metaphor you can probably take is, um, you know, I guess McGregor where he's, you know, he's fighting whatever, he's sparring with eight lads just to perform against the one. Um, so it's kind of like that. Like it's just, re it's really kind of rinse and repeat. So in terms of actually playing, like, you, you know, it's a different buzz, obviously, you know, you're playing for Leinster and stuff, but I think once, once you're in there, it actually just becomes like any other game. Um, but yeah, like obviously it was, it was class, obviously running next to the RDS and kind of playing with, you know, different people, you know, like, so Jack Conan, obviously he's a good friend of mine. So it was cool to kind of make my debut with him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the, the lads are so fine tuned now because they train all the time with the senior team that that's probably why you see the young lads in Leinster playing so well. Yeah, Chad, like you were saying there about Stuart Lancaster, and a lot of people probably won't know about his actual role and what he's done. If you look at the likes of James Ryan and Dan Levy and lads like that uh, that have come in, that would have been probably a year or two younger than you that would have experienced that academy training with the first team. And it's probably something that is, you know, Irish rugby has been on this upward curve for years, but it's it's definitely helped Stuart Lancaster and, and what he's done with, with, with the likes of James Ryan and Dan Levy. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, it may sound like blasphemy, but I think that the barrier to young players getting an opportunity was Joe Schmidt. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people will listen to this and gasp in shock. Um, but the reality is Joe Schmidt was very traditional with what he did. He did an incredible job with Ireland, obviously, and with Leinster. But it was very much a case of, I know who my guys are. Um, you know, even if they're you know, kicking into the 30s or the, you know, the, you know, into that, you know, the, he knew exactly what he thought was going to win. And as a result, made it really difficult for young players to break through. And that's why, you know, no young players at that time in the academy were training with the seniors. Um, and then Lancaster came in and, yeah, as you said, just flipped the script. You just said, you know, throw the book out. I want everyone to be a leader. It doesn't matter if you're 18, doesn't matter if you're 32. Everyone's going to be training with the senior squad. And it just gave kind of people the idea that everyone was on the same playing field. Um, and that's kind of, I think, when young lads see that there's not so much dread or doubt in front of them that's when you 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 kind of you get that kind of you couple that with confidence and you get yeah lads like james ryan uh you know gary um dan levy all those kind of lads max deegan caitlin doris like all of these young lads now who are just you know playing out of their skin yeah exactly and then because it's your lancaster we see that great photo which we'll put up on our social media of you trying to lift mike ross oh yeah 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 that's it that was a that was a funny old <laughs> funny old photo. Um, yeah, that was actually probably one of my earlier trainings. I think it was a bit of a shock to the system, but uh, I think uh, I can forever be proud that I took the weight of uh, Big Mike Ross on my back that day. And just to tell us a little bit more on, on what you said there, which missed. So when Lancaster came in, was it a media change where he he brought the academy through and said you're all training with the the first team? Uh, and it was just that or was there other stuff that he tried to include you guys in or yeah I mean like the reality is and again I, I wouldn't be afraid to, to say it um, even now there's a big problem with the culture in Leinster um, and you know maybe there will be some of my, my ex teammates who will listen to this but they would probably tend to agree with me like there was just a massive massive rift between the academy and the senior team um, and that went for everything so that went for team social so you know academy would never mix with the senior team and like I, I do completely appreciate that you know you've got to earn your stripes and I, I get that but the reality is if you want depth in the squad you need everyone to be on the same level um so you know the you know the academy the, you know the change rooms were kind of were split and they still are that's the design of the building but it's a lot more inclusive so you'll have kind of senior lads you know dipping over to the, the other side and the academy lads not afraid to go into the senior side and things like that and um, so we kind of just threw that the book out and kind of just reinvented how people saw the team kind of that you know the way it used to be i think was you know the older more seasoned guys would look at a young lad and kind of be a case of you know you, you don't really know what you're doing whereas kind of lancaster came in and gave everyone a freedom to to express themselves both on the pitch and in meetings so you know naturally what that's going to do is just breed confidence um, and obviously the case is the fine line is obviously if a young lad is getting too overly confident well then 
naturally enough, one of the old dogs is going to give him a slap around the head. Uh, but yeah, I think one of the biggest things and probably one of the most impressive things I think um, Stuart did was actually come in and actually flip the culture. Um, because, you know, the reality was when I came in to Leinster, I think they had just got knocked out of the... Uh, I think they lost to Toulon pretty badly or something in the quarter final, and the kind of heads were down. The kind of glory day seemed to be over uh, post Schmidt. Um, and he, to be fair, he came in and kind of rocked the boat and changed everything. And obviously, that's, you know, two years later is all it takes for a club to be back on cloud nine. And it starts with the culture, always does. Yeah, it just it sounds like from that, and it's, I suppose Schmidt's carried that on with Ireland, that there, there's a, he had a little bit of a short term yeah. mentality, a bit of. Um, you know, a Jose Mourinho to give a, a football analogy in terms of you know he'll get the success, he'll he'll do what the job is, but there maybe he's not looking at the long term picture where someone like Stuart Lancaster would would happily, um, would would happily you know sacrifice a bit of short term success for long term. Yeah, and I think he gets a bad rap. I mean, um, you know, if you look at the England team, so obviously World Cup did not go to plan for him um, in 2015. But the reality is, you know, you roll on. So you roll on four years. Um, you're looking at the the World Cup that's just gone. I think what like thirteen of that starting fifteen were involved in Lancaster's World Cup because he was just blooding them as as young players in his campaign. And probably, albeit too soon, the reality is though he knew where the talent was. Uh, he probably just didn't get it right in terms of international versus club experience. And he's probably learned a thing or two from that. But, you know, he obviously knows a good young player when he sees one. You look at that England team that probably should have won the World Cup, not many people would look back at 2015 and go, oh, yeah, I saw all of them playing when they got knocked out. Um, so, yeah, I guess the, the different thing is, yeah, as you said, he is looking at long term. You know, I think arguably if, if he had managed to, to hold that England role down, you know, a lot of those players were, you know, were the guts of that England team that were kind of dominating over, you know, in the lead up to that World Cup. Yes, uh, one one thing in terms of that you you've, you've mentioned Stuart Lancaster. I wonder what, what was the, uh, his relationship with Leo Cullen like, and and did, was it just a seamless transition when he came in, and was Leo on board with all these ideas, or how did it work between the two of them? Yeah, I think uh, you know Leo probably you know I think it was his first head coaching role, so I think he was very happy. I think Lancaster was hired as the defensive coordinator, but I think ultimately everyone knew he had more head coach experience, and I think the way they kind of worked it was. You know, Leo would have the final say over everything. Um, but really, like, Lancaster was kind of running the team in terms of, you know, the way Leinster played, um, the philosophies and different things. And then, you know, Leo would ultimately have that final say from being a stalwart for so long, and actually understanding the values of the club above everything else. So when you've got someone coming in, and I think that's the cool thing, to be fair, about Leo, you know, he obviously gave Lancaster a lot of... Um, freedom to express himself as a coach um, while also keeping the traditional values that he's known since his whole career. And I think when you, you mix that balance, you get a very, you know, a very well-oiled machine. Charlie, Char, Char, just take you back to your uh, Black Rock days. Obviously, for people that know, you, you won the SCT in 2013 as captain, but it wasn't an easy run even to the final. You, you had a couple of tight encounters. <laughs> yeah, geez, I think I'll look back at that probably. And I think above all else in, in what I did in my short rugby career I'll probably look back at that that 2013 year as probably my my favourite in terms of playing with your best mates and going through the, the trials and tribulations of schoolboy high school football esque kind of uh, romance if you like um, yeah we uh, I think mean, we had a smooth sailing first two games and then in the semi-final one of the lads got sent off uh, we were down 12 points with five minutes to go and ended up scoring 14 in four minutes <laughs> to get to the final, which was uh, somewhat of a miraculous achievement. I still think my, my parents probably still can't believe it to this day. Uh, we'll sometimes throw it on the, the old Satanta telly box when they can find it, uh, just to kind of rile me up. Um, and then, yeah, so that was that was very kind of interesting how that all panned out. Um, I actually, I actually think know, I remember hearing that you guys were losing or something and... I think saying my dad saying and I was kind of like Asher, look, that's that's that over. Unfortunately, yeah, sure. We, I, yeah, I, I, I was at it, Charlie. I think you would probably have been in school because coming up to the mocks or whatever. And I remember being at it. My dad was like, "Oh, come on!" I think it might have actually been raining or whatever. And my dad was like, "We might go, we might go." And I think we actually did he hold on it because I remember the the try was a real, 
you know, six or seven phases to get over the line. I remember, I remember the roar of the Black Rock crowd that day. I could, I, I'd never forget that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, yeah, you're dead right. It was like a couple of phases. They were all out on their feet. I think it was a classic case that we weren't the biggest team at the time, but we were so fit. <laughs> like we ran for days. It was very much like your, as I said, your classic kind of high school football miracle. You know, the team who was leading were kind of out on their feet and exhausted, and we just kept trucking away and scored in the last minute. Um, and won the thing. Um, so yeah, like I think I guess you know if you're actually looking at Leinster and how that develops players, like you know when you're playing in front of that massive crowd under that pressure, you need to execute. You you are winning those games, and um, I think that's why they you know they'll obviously say that Leinster Schools Cup is going to be the best breeding ground for like young players in terms of performing. Um, but then yeah, obviously luckily enough, then into the final, similar kind of story. Um, we've got uh, I think we were we were down by six points or so or seven points um you know with i think only again six or seven minutes to go um and we managed to get a literally a lucky bounce like i even looking back would have thought we were dead and buried we got a lucky bounce into sean Cochran's hands who now plays for pro in uh, atlanta in the American kind of rugby league over there. So he's kind of killing it, still playing, which is great to see. Uh, but yeah, the ball just miraculously found itself into his hands and he pretty much ran the pitch. And then we kind of went from one one wing to the other and Jack Parra scored in the corner and uh, Ringrose kicked the goal to, to take us to victory. So yeah, a very exciting cup run. It's something I'll, I'll never forget, for sure. And what's that pressure like, Charlie? Because obviously to picture it, it was it's Blackrock and Michaels, probably the two biggest rugby schools in Dublin and then at all week and, and all year it's been building up to this and then you get to the day of the final Dan and you just you, you can't get over the emotion of it and, and the, the big how big an occasion it yeah, is yeah Charlie just before you come in there like I read somewhere that like Graham even Graham Henry sent you guys a, a good luck message so uh, you know with all that kind of added pressure uh, as well as doing a leaving cert year and obviously it's, it's a do or die game in the sense that there is no next year talk about the, a bit of the, about the build up to it and obviously being captain as well it's just huge like it's it's everything to like a to a young lad trying to make it in rugby like it's you know if you're in a rugby school you know the funny thing is when when i was growing up like when i was playing with dad in the garden or you know if i was going for a walk age eight or you know six whatever it is he would always say you know like oh let's go drop goal to win the senior cup it was never about ireland so it was always about senior cup first um, and like my uncle captain clongos and won um, so there was always that kind of within the family and, you know, who would do it, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, the, the build-up was just massive. Um, it's, it's yeah, it, it can't really be described at such a young age to have that kind of pressure of like, you know, you know massive school, you know, you've got coaches, scouts, everyone coming from everywhere to, to look at this game because ultimately, you know, you can you can factor in the, the Munster Skills Cup and Connacht, but nothing will really compare to the Leinster one. And I think, yeah, I, you know, just the magnitude of the situation. I think, be, you know, the weird thing is it does become a bit of white noise. Like when you're surrounded by your teammates the whole time, you very much, I mean, this is in the professional game as well. You see it as just another game. You can try, you can kind of block out the noise that comes with it. But in terms of like Michaels, I mean, the, the funny thing is we, you know, I'd been in school at that stage six years. We hadn't beaten them once apart from that Christmas game um, that we played in their home patch. Uh, in December it was so we we had never experienced beating Michaels ever when I was in school apart from that game so belief is a lot of things so I think we went into that final going like right well now we know we can beat them um, you know we beat them this year for the first time ever so we can just do it again and um, I think we always had that in our head that we could, could go out and actually do the job which thankfully we ended up doing You, you mentioned um, earlier on about the school setup and how close you guys are um, and I suppose to combine that with the, you know, a, a typical week when you're training, uh, training sessions, gym sessions, I know, Sean, you want to come in there as well? Just... Yeah, well, just like you, you, when I talked to some of my friends who would have played SCT rugby and it's actually the relentlessness of it. You know, they're training every day, they're putting their body through this and then they have to go back into, into school and do the leaving. Is that something, looking back now, Charlie, you go, she's worry a bit mad to be training four or five times a week doing all this gym work putting this much pressure on, on your body when you're supposed to be doing a lot of school work. Is that, is that a hard balance to find? I mean, yeah, the, the balance is definitely hard to find. I think it's, it's definitely a, you know, something that we'll talk about in this pod because balance is something that I struggled with massively in terms of where I should be putting my energy. 
um, you know, should it be in, in rugby or should it be elsewhere? And that's something that I struggled with for so long. And it definitely started in school. But the reality is you just love the game so much and you obviously love the, your schoolmates, as I'm sure you lads do, and are still in touch with them. Um, above all else, you know, rugby has been everything. Your whole philosophy, you know, in school has all been down to that. Um, so I think above all else, you just enjoy it. You know what I mean? I think you enjoy getting up at seven for the for the weight sessions. You know, you've got the lunchtime line outs and backs walkthroughs, and then you've got, you know, the, the post you know, post school, then you're in for your pitch session. The whole thing was, so you know, so when I was that back three a day, Charlie, yeah? Three days. Three sessions. a day, yeah, 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 yeah. And you look back at it and you go, oh, geez, that's mad. But like, we just loved it. You know what I mean? Because we knew, obviously, at that time, we had something special in the works. And, you know, I think ultimately we just kept wanting to get better. We knew we could win the cup. So it was a case of like, yeah, let's just relish this. Like, let's just enjoy it. Uh, but for sure, you know, like that's it's something that I look back on now. I would definitely wouldn't regret a thing. Um, but, but for sure, I think balance was something that I struggled with for so long, especially given the uncertainty of a, of a rugby career versus the security of going into a nine to five that everyone else does. So once once the final try is scored and then you actually kick the ball uh, out to, to win it for BlackRock and then the camera pans on to you and it's almost like a like a famous shot of you celebrating. Is that just relief? And then when your mum, Valerie, hands you the, the trophy at the end, is that just all like, this, it has been worth it. You know, we were right to do this. We, we, we had something special. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Like, uh, you know, funnily enough, like uh, it sounds quite cliche now, but like, like I... Honestly, genuinely would have, would have dreamt about kicking the ball out. Like, I used to have repetitive dreams about asking the ref, is it time? It sounds so funny to say that. Um, it sounds like I'm sure yeah, he's, he's taking, the, taking the mick here. But honestly, like, I, I had those kind of dreams where I would, like, you know, that's all I'd be thinking about. And, like, it's weirdly enough, it's the first time, you know, the only time really in my life that I could actually visualize something before it happens. Um, and so, yeah, I think when it happened, it was actually, you know, it was just the most elated, it was almost like an angel of elation just lifted me up. It was almost like a dream and it sounds again very cliche but just, yeah, just absolutely incredible feeling to know that like everything that you've been doing for the whole year with all of your maximum focus has actually come off and then obviously to share with mum then to to give me the cup at the time um, makes it that family affair. So now obviously we've got two of those photos in my family, we've got myself and my mum and then my uncle and my granny doing the same photo for Klondos, class, um, which is pretty cool. So yeah, so no, I mean, look, you know, looking back at looking back at that, it's probably the the happiest time I would say in, in my rugby rugby career. Uh, moving on to rugby as uh, an Irish rugby in a in a bigger picture, and you know, by the sounds of um, schools rugby and what you guys did, you know, the perception out there is that even the club game and to a certain extent the under twenties might not be as organised or some some of those teams as 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 a schools rugby um, game. Is that sustainable? You know, in Irish rugby, you know, it's, I know it's a tradition and it's been going on for a long time, but um, is, is that is that sustainable or healthy for the game to be focused so much on school rugby? I think it, it has to start somewhere. Uh, I think it has to be a replacement for the likes of, of football. Um, I think one of the things that I'm a massive advocate of is I really want to see world rugby open up like world football has. Um, I think, you know, we don't have academies at 14 like they do at football. Um, so I think you need that competitive edge at an early age to be able to develop people both mentally and physically in that kind of environment. Um, I think, you know, if you look at kind of under 20s, there is a very, very clear reason why Leinster underage players typically dominate all of the other provinces when they come into these academies. It's just because that kind of setup is, is much, much better. Um, and I know, to be fair, it's definitely getting better all the time. Um, you know, the one, you know, obviously, look, the one criticism I definitely have is for young guys, you know, there's so many talented young players and the AIL is great, but... You know, there definitely is, a, there's definitely an in-between spot. You know, there's definitely a step up between top level AIL to Leinster A and then Leinster A to, to senior level. Um, and I think, you know, I know they, they kind of got rid of the, the British and Irish Cup at that kind of in-between level. Um, but I think a lot of players get, you know, left by the wayside who, you know, potentially could have the, the talent to, to kind of kick on. But definitely it does, you know, definitely does start um, with that competitive edge in, in school. You mentioned that in between stage, um, you know, that kind of be the, 
the spot where say a, a player coming out of school doesn't make it to academy uh, I, I suppose you know you'd look at uh, if they weigh up their options they're in college you know a lot of people your age Sean you've mentioned to me before about you know a lot of players that wouldn't necessarily go back to team sports and why would they risk an injury if they're just playing if they just go gym three to three or four times a week you know yeah well if you look at it from like a Gaelic standpoint Brian Fenton didn't make the Dublin minors he went into UCD he played a lot of college football at Freshers you know so despite miss having that early setback fa- found his way into the under 21s I I don't know how Charlie how common it is. Say if someone misses out on an academy place to to go to to a Lansdowne, will work th- that real hard and and get to that level and then get it back into the Leinster uh, side. Is that common enough practice or? No, it's it's extremely extremely difficult, and it's one of the it's one of the big faulting points of Irish rugby. Um, and you know, to be fair, it's, it's nobody's fault. There's only four teams, um, and the reality is, you know. You know, all all places are going to be booked up. Um, you know, I think the biggest disappointment is, and I think where people fall down is there isn't enough teams for people to actually go and get experience. Like for example, there's no such thing as a player from one academy going on loan to a place in, in England or a place in France. You know, you rarely hear that to get that kind of experience to kind of get back into the, you know, in in the back door, back into pro rugby. Um. You know, the AIL is great. It does a lot of great things. But in my mind, it just doesn't hit that pro level, that in-between level, you know, where you need to go. Um, In-between level, I think you're looking at kind of Leinster A, English Championship rugby level, where it's up a gear in physicality, it's up a gear in skills, but it's not quite your kind of Leinster Premier team. Um, And the reality is there's just not enough... There's not enough opportunities for people in Ireland, given there's only four teams, to to find their way, you know, back. Because Ireland produced so many good players who just give up because they don't even have a chance to to go anywhere to prove their worth. Um, and as you said, Sean, like you know, they could go to an AIL club, but it's really, really difficult to to kind of find your way in through there unless there's you know a massive bout of injuries in a particular position. And I suppose the problem for rugby that they face there is if people do drop off and they've had the high of the, the, the rugby school team and they've missed out on that academy place and like you said there isn't that in between I suppose college they might refocus um, on, on their careers and m- maybe go into other sports and they may never pick up a rugby ball yeah exactly and I think it's that's the saddest part I think you know looking at you know, looking back at everything you know there's only four teams so you know every four years you're going to get one stud in each position um, and that's the way the cycle goes. Whereas you look at the English teams, and they've got they've got twenty prem teams, and then they've got another twenty championship teams that that kid that you know that people can go to. And I do get that it's a bigger country, but the reality is there's still better opportunities for people to prove themselves at that in between level. Um, you know, the reality is if you know an AIL team was to play against a championship team, they probably get spanked. Um, and it's just the reality of it. It's not saying that the AIL is, is a bad standard. It's not at all. It's probably, you know, it's really, really high. Um, but in terms of like the consistency across the board, you know, you, you know that level is just a, a next one up. And it is unfortunate that, you know, Irish players who who may have that opportunity to to, to kind of, I think, you know, I was listening to, to your podcast last week. And I think your uncle had said it's a great example of somebody who sticks at it. Um, the reality is, in Ireland, you don't have anything to stick at. You know, you can't keep going because in England there's the kind of foreign player rule. So, you know, an English an English team either has to take you, or they've got to take another kind of English guy that they're unsure about and kind of contracts and everything else and legalities. They have to go with the English guy. Um, so, in terms of that backdoor element, there's not a lot of opportunities for people to find the backdoor, and that's why when they get released or you know they don't get into academies, that's why they'll just drop off uh, when they probably did have a lot of potential to go pro. Yeah, and I suppose the the scare of injuries and injuries being a lot common, more common in rugby, the likes of concussion and stuff. And, and just moving on to that, Charlie, I wanted to have a quick uh, discussion on that, a very brief one in terms of your own experience with concussion, if you've had any, and. Did you feel um, people moving in the right direction throughout your years in BlackRock in terms of more education around concussion? Uh, I know the RFU were doing great work the last couple of years, but back in your school days, was it something that was talked about as much? Not at all. And like it, it is a case. And like, to be fair, they have completely addressed it. You know, we've gone through you know tons of modules when I was in Leinster um, about you know trying to get their head right. But 
you know, the reality is you, you might have done, you know, three years of damage when it wasn't priority. And then, in, you know, you could have just made it a little bit better for you as you enter the pro game. Um, my own experience for a concussion, I, I probably had my most amount of concussions that were like minor, um, where, you know, it was probably a bit rocked, like you might be in a boxing match, which ultimately is a concussion, but probably not serious enough that I would have flagged it. But ultimately now, after taking time off, sometimes I'll just get mad headaches from nowhere. Um, and I might, I mean, it might just be that I get, get headaches like everyone, but there's always that thing in the back of my mind that goes, you know, is this... Could this be down to that? Could this be down to the knocks that I've had? Because um, you just never know when you put your body, you know, in those kind of situations. Um, so I think, you know, from a young age, I think everyone naturally, you know, coaches, parents, everyone is going to look after that. But there was no real education. So nobody really knew what the signs were or what to look out for. It's only, kind of, as you said, in recent times, it gets, you know, it's, get, it's, it's gotten better. Yeah, just just to finish up, uh, Charlie, and, and the end of your story in terms of your career with Leinster. So obviously you made that appearance in December. How how did the rest of it play out there uh, in terms of your career with Leinster and finishing up with rugby? Yeah, so I mean it was it was you know quite a I would say probably a, not a dark time, and um, but for me it was a very uncertain time. I think in the last year that I played, I, I really you know, didn't, you know, it's probably something I wouldn't admit, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't uh, cope very well mentally. Like I had a lot of anxiety and that came off the kind of back of the uncertainty again, kind of drifting into the, when I initially came into the academy, you know, nothing was given to me as a certain, it was always like, kind of, you have to prove yourself. Um, and so I kind of knew, you know, you know, the times when people were hearing about their senior contracts, it was just, you know, I wasn't hearing anything. Uh, I didn't have anything kind of around me, you know, with interest from other clubs. Um, I think there was, there was only so much, that, you know, you can kind of tell yourself to, you know, I kind of looked around and felt quite lonely that, you know, I didn't really feel that I had anyone kind of, you know, back in my corner. And not that they should have or not that I probably deserved to have anyone there. But I think for me, it was kind of the final straw. Mentally, I think I, I had checked out. I kind of knew that this wasn't for me. Um, you know, through through kind of everything that happened, you know, I had an amazing time when I was playing, but I think I knew at the end of that, it just, you know, I wasn't going to, this wasn't going to be for me. And I, I don't think I was really above all else, you know, I'm not sure if I would have been given the, the opportunities um, ahead of some of the, you know, the talented guys. And I can, I could sit back and say, even to this day, some of the guys in there, you know, Gibson Park, Luke McGrath, Nick McCarthy, you know, these guys were much better than me. And I think that was that's what made me leaving the game um, a little bit easier because I knew that, you know, no matter how hard I worked, I couldn't get bigger, firstly. Um, and also, it, you know, I, I knew that these guys were just, uh, you know, had an ed, had that edge over me. Um, and so I think that's what made it, made it a little bit easier for me to, to kind of manage it and move on. Yeah, so talk to, obviously it must have been a hard thing for you to admit that to yourself. Yeah, for sure. I think because I, you know, I, I never, as a kid, you know, like we'll go back to us playing games out the front. I mean, you lads would probably testify to that. I never doubted myself once. I think I knew I could smash a free kick against your dad's car and beat you in the net from 50 yards. And I think most of the time I probably would have given it a really good crack. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, as, you know, you know, schools rugby was great and I got given so many great opportunities. But I think as I left school, you know, I, I probably wasn't as backed as, as maybe what I thought I would be. And then that kind of creeps into your psyche. You know, first not getting the, the Irish opportunity when I thought I probably deserved it. Not getting the Leinster Academy contract straight off the bat when I thought I deserved it. So doubt started to creep in really early doors. And then as my career developed, you know, I was on the bench quite a lot for Leinster seniors, but I was never brought on even if we were like 15 points up. So it was very much a case of, you know, why am I here? You know, why am, you know, Clearly, there's there's a massive element of doubt over me, um, and you know that stuff is going to take its toll mentally, um, and I think I kind of just realised then, as I said, you know, looking looking back at everything, you know, I definitely probably wasn't at the at the standard that some of the guys are are there now, and you know, I'm not ashamed to to admit that I can kind of hold my head high and, and walk away and know that I, I I made the right decision at the at, you know at the end of it. But Chad, does that come from the culture for for those of us to know you're a really bubbly character, you have a lot of you know, uh, I wouldn't say arrogance, but you've got a lot of confidence in your in your in your ability, and rightly so. But does that come from the culture of not really? Did you ever feel comfortable in in the Leinster setup? Yeah, it's it's a great question, Sean. I I don't think I ever felt truly myself. I think, 
Um, you know, as you said, I was quite a bubbly character. I like to like to joke. I like to laugh. I think when I first came in there, you know, it felt it felt difficult to kind of express myself for for who I am. Um, and I think that was partly to do with the initial culture, the aftermath of Joe Schmidt. So my first year, you know, Lancaster wasn't there. And that's why it definitely improved for him. So you look at someone like James Lowe, who'd be a, a friend now, but like, you know, he's not afraid to express himself at all now. Um, you know, and he's been there for, for a year and a half, two years when I was in there. Um, but yeah, for sure, I, I, I struggled a lot to, to try and be able to kind of express myself and understand who my identity was. And I think that's that was one of the big things that I realized that, you know, maybe I didn't have uh, maybe I didn't have the talent to be able to offload some of my kind of jokey personality. You know, you often talk about, you know, the jokesters often the ones, you know, putting three in the back of the net in the weekend. And I wasn't doing that. Um, so I think when I, you know, when you when I can strip it all back, you know, I can, as I said, I can kind of look at it and go, you know, hang on, maybe, maybe I wasn't quite up to scratch here. And just the last, final thing on that, Charlie, I suppose it must have been hard for you then to, if you, if you did realise that maybe you need to rein it in a bit. Um, did you lean on any of the other players there in Leinster? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, definitely. I think, you know, as, you know, for me, self doubt creeped in early and it was always present. That's the thing. I think, you know, from, from actually being given my contract all the way through, I always had self doubt because I kind of had a reason to self doubt. Um, you know, there was, you know, for, for different reasons. Um, so I was always conscious, you know, that, you know, what, you know, I put a lot of pressure on myself as a result because the whole time I was playing to, you know, to, to prove that I could do something when I felt that I was doubted by coaches or you know fellow players whatever it was and even if they didn't make it obvious that that's just what was going through my head um so i, I put relentless pressure on myself to kind of perform and then if you make a, st- a mistake you know then i didn't deal with those demons very well so it just kind of got bad two words for me going mentally and I, you know i did have friends and stuff in there the reality is you know everyone's going through it um and so you know it, it's tough to, to speak with people about that because you know everyone's going through that and, you know, they're, I kind of felt at the time, well, you know, I don't want to burden them with stuff that's probably going on with them as well. They, they, they you know, and then it gets into your psyche where well, then maybe they're just better at handling that than maybe I am. And that's why they're maybe starting to lens and I'm not. So as you can see, it's it's very, you know, it, it can spiral pretty quickly with the thoughts. Um, and that's kind of, yeah, eventually I, I would have said that that kind of uh, tipped me over the edge. And it, how are you now in terms of, you, you mentioned to me, um, you're two years now since you hung up the boots. Um, how are you finding it? Yes, I love it, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's it's a really weird one because, you know, people always ask me why I quit. You look at my last season, you know, Leinster won the European Championship. Leinster A, we got to the final. I won an AIL with Lansdowne. Like, like, you look at it on, this, on paper and be like, you know, Jesus, life is great. Uh, you know, why would you quit now? Um, but I just knew that, you know, inside my head wasn't healthy. Um, and so I kind of stepped away. And life has been honestly brilliant. Like I had, um, I think even, you know, I was in a relationship at the time when I when I came out of playing. And I think even she had noticed a massive difference in me, my personality, in everything. Um, you know, I was more present. I wasn't as worked up. I wasn't as anxious. Um, and then I just kind of worked, you know, obviously I'd been seeing someone in the background, just trying to get my mind healthy. Um, and yeah, so now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm great. I'm gravy. Had a year away in, in Australia, which really put a lot of things into perspective. Um, and now I'm, I'm kind of, as I said, I'm, I'm over living in London, um, you know, living the dream really. So, you know, two years has gone like that. Um, but it's, you know, it's, I, I know I made the right decision because I haven't regretted hanging up the boots once. Brilliant. Uh, listen, Charlie, you've been amazing with your time. But just before we go, I want to fire out really quick, quick fire questions. So I want the, the answers as quick as possible because I know we, we've gone over time here. Uh, cool. Who is your favorite coach? Favorite coach would be Justin Vanstone in, in Black Rock. Oh, well. Wow. Cool. Not your dad, yeah. no? Uh, yeah, I mean, he's up there, but it's sometimes <laughs> a joke and say he, he doesn't count because he was only, uh, only a young fella. But yeah, I guess my dad as well. <laughs> you can uh, give him that one. Best player you play with? A, ooh, best player I played with I gave it to him it's probably Gary Ringrose I would say uh, best opponent best opponent oh that's a tough one probably Tavita Lee I don't know if he's even still around but 
he like scored the 18 tries in the under 20 world championship so i remember him always being someone i was just like Pwah, he's insane wow so the last couple of favorite try favorite try um uh, I'll go with Wales in the World Cup. Why yeah, not? it had to be. Yeah, well, that's good. Be. that's the promo for this uh, podcast. So I was hoping to say that. <laughs> uh, um, last couple of things. I think you mentioned this already. Your peak uh, and your proudest moment of your career. Winning this girls' cup as captain by far, by a yeah. long stretch. Uh, any regrets with your career? Any regrets is to live. My biggest regret would be to that I. I didn't live in the moment and I looked too far ahead. So if I had approached every rugby day thinking that I might have died the next, maybe I, I, I probably wouldn't have been in my head as much. And last one, Charlie, advice you tell your 13-year-old self? Advice I would tell my 13-year-old self? Great question. I would say, this is so cliche, but just just enjoy it. Yeah, you know, Take a breath. You know, nothing, ultimately at the end, end of the day, the way I live my life now is you're not dead. You know what I mean? So any situation that you have, you just need to enjoy it. You need to embrace it. Um, and just not worry. Not, you know, ultimately everything's going to work out. Um, and so, yeah, that would be my biggest thing is just live live to the fullest um, and not not worry too much about about anything. Charlie, thanks a bit for coming on the podcast. No problem at all, boys. It was an absolute pleasure. Thanks a million for having me on. See you, Charlie. And that was our interview with Charlie Rock, uh, Sean. Definitely could have spent all day chatting away to him. Yeah, it was like the good old days there. Charlie's a really bubbly character and great to hear from him again. Yeah. Uh, one thing to go back to the start of the interview uh, on Black Rock, um, I didn't realise to the extent to which he'd fallen out with his manager in fifth year. You know, obviously on the back of making the squad in fourth year, he, he probably had a, a few notions in terms of he was going to make the, the step all the way up to the next couple of years. Yeah, exactly. So when you start in fourth year, you're, you're kind of earmarked as a player for the future that's going to play in fifth year. And then in sixth year, they'll become one of the senior players. So for him to, to go from starting in fourth year to not in fifth year and then to get the captaincy in sixth year probably shows the switch in mindset he had from fifth to sixth, um, which was really, really interesting because a lot of people wouldn't have known that. Yeah, and it's one of those good stories that they ended up winning the whole thing. So it's probably one of those things you don't believe unless it's happened. Uh, moving on to his Leinster career, uh, we learned a lot there about the highs and lows and you know you hear a lot uh, about academies and stuff but I don't think you quite get that insight all the time in terms of somebody that constantly had to prove himself to, to coaches yeah exactly obviously Charlie uh, had a, a difficult time at Leinster towards the end but still played for them and was still around that and really good to hear from someone who, who's been in that setup now gone away he's two years not even playing club rugby so to come away and get his take on it from a fresh point of view obviously when you're playing in the academy you're in that bubble you think everything is normal this is what is acceptable so for us to hear from some of the things that Leinster got wrong maybe with, with young players over the years and then what the likes of Stuart Lancaster has brought in that has changed and probably opened the door for the likes of you know James Ryan, Dan Levy, Caelan Doris these types of players to come in yeah, we heard a lot about him, about being in his own head and self-doubt. And I suppose someone that's had the success for him in schools, rugby and all the way up, it must have been a hard thing for him to constantly you know, have that rejection or constantly not quite make um, to certain teams or certain milestones in his career. Yeah, see, Charlie's a really bubbly character, and especially on the pitch, he's very creative. So for you to go into a position where you were one of the best players in the Interpros uh, at underage, to then go into the Leinster setup, and, and you know, you're always trying to prove yourself to senior players, and you're not training with them all the time. You know, you, you can't really be yourself, and maybe Charlie felt that, and that can reflect in your rugby because, like, someone like him, you know, you think of someone in, in, in football or Gaelic games that's really creative. If you get put into a, a system that doesn't really allow creativity, it can affect you and it can knock you. And you can say, well, if I'm, if I'm being, if I can't be myself, then, then I'm not going to play as well as I normally can. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose it must have been a very hard thing for him to admit in the end that, you know, there were certain players that were just better than him. And I'd say that took a long time for him to admit that to himself and be easy with that decision yeah exactly and and when you've had more than two years away like he has he can reflect on it with the eye of, of hindsight so uh, again he spoke really well and and probably something that a lot of people listening wouldn't have expected to hear from especially the, what he was saying about joe schmidt obviously everyone sees joe schmidt as an unbelievable coach and, and and you could you could argue that what he did was he brought success back to irish rugby but he hasn't left a long-standing legacy that's probably been brought from Stuart lancaster if you look at leinster's academy is, is far superior to any of the other provinces you've got to give a lot of credit to Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster so you know last in legacy of, of Joe Schmidt it's 
probably won't be the success that we've had. We've had a bit of a peed off now from when he's gone. So obviously great coaches leave a lasting legacy for themselves and, and probably something that Joe Schmidt hasn't left. Yeah, it'd be interesting with Ireland over the next couple of years to see can we build on that legacy more quick than Leinster or do we need to put those building blocks in again? Yeah, but if you think about it, if look at someone like Eddie O'Sullivan. He mightn't have had the best coaching career, but the legacy he left is he gave debuts to the likes of Ronan O'Gara, got those types of players and then four or five years later they go and win a Grand Slam under Declan Kidd these things don't happen overnight players need the experience of playing international rugby for, for a long time yeah so moving on to to that in between age that we talked about in terms of rugby's um you know probably issue where they have players in schools rugby who have a goal of after schools rugby they have to make an academy and if they don't quite climb that mountain and that was their one goal what's the point in putting themselves through all those injuries and stuff so you know we spoke a lot there about that in between age and there there's very rare ca- cases where a player who misses out on the academy and ends up, you know, going and putting the hard work in the club, like you mentioned, Brian Fenton and GA. Yeah, exactly. And looking now, when when you hear Charlie reflect on it, that is probably the biggest flaw in terms of players' development. You can't have people, you know, being having to peak at a certain age. You know, people are late bloomers. You think of Brian Fenton in football. Look at Jack Byrne, who's gone, gone to England, come back to Ireland to go hopefully back over in a few years. So definitely something the IRFU need to look at. Obviously, at the end of the day, there's only four province club. The club game, the AIL, is, isn't as strong as probably, you know, other countries like England and Wales. So there's something the IRFU need to look at because at the end of the day, you have someone like Charlie who was who was so good underage and then three or four years later, he's he's, he's not playing club rugby. Yeah, and I think the, the biggest problem there with rugby is it's not a case that these players, you know, won't end up making it to the top. It's just that they'll never pick up a rugby ball again. It's too easy then when they, when they stop to stop playing rugby, you know. If you think about it, he's probably hadn't had an injury in, in two or three years. He's probably as, as fit and healthy as he's ever been. And But you want players still playing the game, you want players still enjoying the game. And, and maybe, you know, even if they're playing for for a Monkstown or, or a Gary Owen or a Lansdowne, they'll go, do you know what, if I put in another good performance, I make the next step up and then I make the next, next step up. And all of a sudden, you know, you're only a stage away from, from the full Leinster side. Yeah, last thing I wanted to talk about there was the bubbly character aspect of it that you touched on with Charlie and he talks about being a bubbly character. It must have been hard for him in, in those down times to, to, to admit to himself those, those kind of issues that we talked about. But, you know, we heard there, you know, he's, he's talked to people, he's, he's managed to get his head in a good space. I suppose for people listening, it's very important that if you are going through these things, everyone is and it's, it's very important to talk about these things. Especially in sport and especially when, you know, he talked about the lack of uncertainty there. He was never, you know, he could never plan for the future really. He was always thinking next game next season and and that's very hard at that at a, at a young age like that where you want security about your career you know you want to know if you if you can really pursue this long term so obviously the anxiety kicks in and then obviously it's something that young males especially don't probably speak about and Charlie spoke there about well sure probably everyone's going through the same so you don't really want to put a burden on anyone um, especially in a professional setup and obviously Leinster at that time you spoke about the culture you know it was around the time where Leinster had the success so the, obviously the, the senior players felt a real seniority and they had been there done it so for Charlie coming in looking at these players he's watching Grand Slams and 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 Heineken Cups to to go into a dressing room or to even go into the same building as them. Obviously, he would have felt vulnerable. He would have felt um, not himself. He couldn't he couldn't show his personality onto people. And again, for people that know Charlie, even see him play, he's really bubbly, really creative. For someone like Charlie, he wears his heart in his sleeve. And to then go and and again go into an, a senior setup and, and you can't be yourself That that's definitely where the self-doubt would start creeping in and obviously Leinster looked at that obviously something that Stuart Lancaster and Leo Cullen brought in so it's definitely something where if you look at it now young players are making that breakthrough and in Charlie's day and, and probably in the years previous they didn't Yeah and I suppose it's important for Leinster academies and stuff to, to, get, to keep players mindful that not all of them are going to make and a vast majority of them are not and to have that set up with your education and, and, and a job and I suppose the best thing Charlie did was, was go away for a year in Australia really kind of put things in perspective and you know now he's living away in London and he's, he's having a great time yeah it's probably they say about that about football clubs as well they treat um, young people uh, wrongly they treat them as, as products um, and the clubs do so definitely something that Leinster I know are quite big on education but still at that that age when you're trying to make a career and there's a lack of uncertainty education has to be you know a big priority brilliant Jeno fascinating chat with Charlie <laughs> So 
So moving on to the, over the next few weeks, we've some exciting interviews planned. We've got GA stars coming in. We've got comedians, referees as well. If you'd like to contact us, the podcast or want anything to discuss, it's at Tackling Sport on all social media channels. Our email is editor at TacklingSport.com or indeed check out our website where all podcasts and articles are available, TacklingSport.com. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, we'd really appreciate a review. Uh, and on all, all other platforms, please follow, like and subscribe. So... Sean, we're playing out this week with Dee Cullen's new single, Rainbow Weather, a, a small bit of a Beatles vibe to it. Yeah, exactly. Another local talent, a great friend of ours growing up. The Cullen's a very talented family from music to acting to writing. So Dara, he's had a l- number of different hits. He released an album a few years ago called The Finish Line, so check that out. Uh, but now Dee Cullen uh, and Rainbow Weather. Brilliant. All I have to say is check us out at Tackle and Sport, all social media. It's goodbye. For, we'll, we'll get the goodbye right this week, Sean. All right? So it's goodbye from Sean. Goodbye. And it's goodbye for me. It's D. Cullen Rainbow Weather. Slang of Hope. Rainbow Weather. I've been thinking about rainbows. I've been thinking about time. But it don't really matter. When it comes to your mind Cause there's folks in the glass house Where they shouldn't throw stones When you live in the love nest But you end up alone I've been thinking about sofas And what they're going to find what you can do It's gonna come to your mind When you wake in the morning When you pull back the blind When you live in the moment You just don't know what you find Oh